spread out, uh, feel free to do that. Also, I mentioned that last time I checked, there was a Grasping God's Word book, third edition, on the back table in the auditorium. So if you need a book tonight to follow along, feel free to go pick that book up and uh, bring it in here. I keep forgetting myself to bring it in here. So, and I think it's still there, so just uh, keep that in mind. All right, well, it's good to see you on a rainy night like this. Um, you know, uh, no better place to be, right? So uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get things kicked off here tonight. Father, we come before you tonight and just thank you, Lord, for the preciousness that is the Word of God. Father, it is the reason that we're here. We truly care about your Word. And we pray, Father, that you would give to us uh, an understanding now, Lord, as we try to determine... Uh, really, who controls the meaning of a text? And so we pray, Lord, that you would just bless our, our thought processes tonight and the information we're going to study, and ask, Lord, that you would help this to be clear and plain to us. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I am in the second edition, and I am on page 175, Who Controls the Meaning? I am in chapter 10. You should be in chapter, I believe, 11. You're in chapter 10 also. Okay, that, that's right. We caught up because last week we did the um, translation, and that's why we were off a chapter. So we've caught up, and uh, that's great. All right. So Who Controls the Meaning is the title. I mentioned on Sunday that this lesson tonight, as well as the next one, which next Wednesday night is Vacation Bible School, so there won't be any tables here, so we won't, won't be meeting. Uh, the week after that, though, is um, levels of meaning. You do not really want to miss either one of these chapters. They are kind of the pinnacle of what we've been talking about. And then the final week, we'll talk about the application process. Remember the interpretive journey? We started out, we want to try to understand what is the meaning uh, to the people that this was written to, what did it what did it mean in their town? And then at the end of it all, the fifth step was doing the application. The applications where it becomes relative to us today in 2018. So we're going to start off by considering tonight uh, exactly uh, who does control uh, this meaning because it is a very important topic. And you'll see in your notes there the most, question, most important question is what is meaning and who controls it? And the options that you have uh, are twofold as far as who is controlling the meaning. One is it's controlled by the author, and the other is that it's controlled by the reader. It has to be one or the other. And there's a great illustration here about Danny and when his kids were small. One of their favorite videos was the old movie The Wizard of Oz, uh, based on the book by Frank Baum. And to Danny's young children, it's a great story. Young girl named Dorothy, her cute little dog named, what was it? Toto. Toto. Yeah. They came o overcame all the odds. They defeated the power of evil and the scary, you know, the monkeys. Remember the flying monkeys? When I was a little kid, that scared me to death. Those flying monkeys. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. And, and yet Dorothy's able to overcome all of those things. And to the young children who watched that, like myself, it had a very simplistic meaning. There wasn't a lot to it. You had the witch, you had the evil, you had the good, and you basically were putting that all together. And so it was very simple. And if you had asked me as a child, you know, what did it mean? I would have told you it was a classic story of good versus evil. And that good in the end triumphed. However, if you look closely into the time period in which this was written, you consider the historical background. Uh, Baum writes this story, and one of the hottest political debates in our country was raging at the time he wrote it. So he is the one who authors the book, and then it's made into a movie. Are we clear on that? So, so you have the author of this book writing and he's writing during this debate time, and the big question was whether or not the U.S. should go uh, back to the gold standard and use that as the basis for the U.S. dollar, or whether we should switch, believe it or not, to silver, okay, was the consideration at the time. So the historical context suggests that the main line of the book 
follow the yellow brick road was probably a reference to the central political issue of the day. Remember, we we're going to follow the yellow brick road, not the silver brick road, right? And so we, we consider that, it's like, oh, okay. So the yellow brick road leads to the great wizard. You know how that was, and they're going down the sidewalk, and they're, you know, there's a castle in front of them, and all of that. And Dorothy gets there, and what does she find? You know, she finds that, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, where is this guy? And Toto does a little bit of investigation, and the next thing you know, he's exposed uh, to Dorothy and her friends, and he's a fraud. And so her real hope was actually in her shoes. You know, in Baum's book, the shoes are silver, and because of colored TVs, uh, they made them red so that they would stand out. They were the ruby red slippers. Let me date myself for you. This was the first movie, TV program, et cetera, et cetera, that I ever saw in color. Everything up until that point in my life was black and white. And my uncle, who was a fairly wealthy man uh, back in those days, had bought a brand new color TV just to watch The Wizard of Oz uh, when it came out. And uh, I remember we, we went to church that Sunday night, and it was on after church, and we beat feet over to Uncle John's house where I could become terrified. So it was great. <laughs> so here's the issue that we find. If you look at this line of interpretation, the characters in the story represent different things. And they're easy to see because, remember, Baum is writing a book, and he's, he's weighing in on an issue that was political during that time period. So the scarecrow, um, and all of them are going to represent different aspects of society or segments of society. The scarecrow is the farmer. Uh, supposedly had no brains. Uh, who would the tin would represent? Well, the factory workers. They have no heart. And then there's the cowardly lion representing political leadership of the country. We also, interestingly, meet the wicked witch of the West and the wicked witch of the East. Both of them are establishments, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. And then you've had those who are in the middle. Who's the heroine? Middle America, Dorothy. She's from Kansas. All right? So, so we look at that, and we then ask, what is the meaning of the Wizard of Oz? You say, well, I, I thought I had it all figured out. So are Danny's kids wrong to interpret the story as a simple good versus evil type of movie? Or did the did not the author intend it to be read as political satire. So are we wrong if we understand it otherwise, if we go on beyond the political satire and say, no, it really means something quite different? Are we, are we wrong if we do that? So this question um, produces a lot of uh, conversation, debate, and so forth, <laughs> as you would. In literary circles, uh, it has been debated for quite some time. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, our notes say, uh, basically, you had the traditional approach. And that applied to any type of literature, biblical or secular. And it assumed that the author determined the meaning. And that the reader's job was to find that meaning. So it was pretty cut and dry, pretty straightforward. However, in the second half of the 20th century, what we're seeing is there's a, a secular literary criticism that basically is, is going to change and argue that the reader and not the author determines what a text means. That's a huge shift, isn't it? It's a huge shift in the mental thought process. In other words, we oftentimes wonder how we arrived where we arrived. We, we wonder, OK, um, how did, how did the U.S. get to this point? Anybody else warm? Okay. <laughs> These are the subtle types of shifts that go on that we don't oftentimes even pick up on. And, and yet they are all part of a process that can lead us into different places that we never anticipated going. Does that make sense? So, as you look at this, um, this question, uh, what is the meaning, um, basically has been tossed back and forth. Biblical scholars started asking that question, what is the meaning? They concluded the term meaning only applies 
as a reader interacts with the text. Now, this is coming out of this new way of thinking. They're looking at it and they're saying, well, <clears throat> it's, um, it's going to take both the reader and the text to produce the meaning. The author, they argue, is no longer involved. Now, that's an interesting thought process, isn't it? Uh, the position that stresses basically that the author um, in the determination of meaning is called authorial intention, the authorial intent. You might want to just kind of put that back in your mind and think about that, authorial intent. Now, the opposing view is going to be called reader response. So what are we going to determine? How are we going to figure this out? Do we believe in authorial intention or reader response? Communication definitely is the central issue uh, because no one's going to force you to look at the wonderful world of Oz as political satire. Uh, nobody's going to force you to do that. You are going to uh, make that determination kind of on your own. Uh, you're going to maybe look at it uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, how does it strike you? And you're going to, you know, ask some, some different questions. So the author has control of the meaning only so far as the reader allows him to. That's as far as the author can control the meaning. What is the author intent? Well, it depends on the reader. How far is the reader willing to go? He gives the illustration of a love letter, right? Here's our, our example. Uh, you receive a mushy love poem written to you by your girlfriend or boyfriend. As you read each word and line of the poem, you'll be searching for the meaning your girlfriend or boyfriend intended. You'll want to know what he or she is trying to say to you. In this situation, you'll be following which pattern? Authorial intent. Authorial intent, right? Because you know what? What, what do you know in your mind? You know in your mind as a reader, you can try to think of it in whatever way you want to think of it, but is, is it really going to matter? What really matters is, does she love me or doesn't she, right? Is he really interested in me or is he not? Right, that's, that's the question that you're going to have to ask. And so you approach a love poem, and if it's written to you, dear so-and-so, put your name at the top, you're very, very interested in authorial intent. And you don't much care about the reader response. So if someone comes up to you and says, well, you know, how's it going with your girlfriend, boyfriend? And you know that the, the letter basically was kind of fuzzy, you know? It wasn't really all together, you know, right on and clear cut. And I think she still likes me, um, you know? And, and you're kind of going back and forth on that. You can try to do the reader response thing and make it sound better than it is. But does that change reality? Not at all. Not at all. And so we would look at it and we would say, what's really important here is what does the author mean? What's the author mean? Uh, maybe you've seen this play out. Stop and think about it for a moment. Uh, the whole aspect of authorial intent versus reader response. Have you seen a shift as to how people interpret things? Has anybody seen that? Oh, yeah. Can you, anybody give an example? Supreme Court. Supreme Court, what a great example. There you go. Yeah, yeah. They look for justices that will uphold the Constitution. That's all we're asking. We're not asking for a reader response. We're asking what did the framers of the Constitution mean? And you have a lot of questions and there's a lot of things bandied about and unfortunately, if you put activist judges on there, what is it meant when we say someone's an activist judge? We're basically saying they're going to apply reader's response. That's exactly what they're going to do. They do not regard authorial intent as that significant. So that's a great, thank you, John, great illustration. Anybody else have an illustration that you picked up on and something comes to your mind. All right. That's a, that was a great one. That'll stick with us. That, that's good. That's real good. So when you stop and you think about this whole uh, challenging two-part uh, question, which way do you go, 
we want to be conscious of the fact that sometimes we do change the meaning that the author intended, sometimes because we don't like the meaning, right? We don't like the meaning, and so we're going to change it. So I'm a little hung up here because we're kind of making it an, an A or B, and I know that's what the author intended here, but um, I, I think there's a whole piece of this that's, that's missing, and that is you know, communication theory, uh, Marshall McLuhan is one that came up with the message is the, the method is the message, or the medium is the message. So you know, part of what, what maybe we're going to touch on here is um, when scripture used to be passed on verbally, mm -hmm. it took on a different meaning, right? We assume authorship and intention, but it was passed along verbally uh, in the control of the Catholic Church in terms of how they were issuing uh, God's word, right? Okay. As opposed to we entered in a time where we could read it ourselves, and now we're back to a point where our constituents, our audience, basically our body, is relying on the pastor then to verbally interpret what God is is moving or telling you. Okay. So you, you yeah. see what I'm saying? So there's oh, yeah. a third part in my mind, yeah. and that is the, the, the method is the message, or this is this yeah. way of communicating it. Right. Yeah, well, that fit into all this? I, I think when we go into the area of the communication, of course, right now, at this point in this text here tonight, we have not um, broached that issue of, okay, what should our response be to the Bible? Should it be authorial? We haven't done that. We're still in the secular realm. Okay. So we're going to bring that down. We're going to kind of consider that. Now, once we arrive at that, those are all about very valid points. And I'd be happy to um, fill out some thoughts that I have about that. I think that's a wonderful observation. Well, it's a horrible observation, <laughs> but it is real. And I think it, 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 it definitely speaks to where we are today in Christianity. And I think that that is, is helpful. Really helpful. So, been a while since a professor uh, said it was a horrible observation. So I appreciate it. Yes. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say, we might get to this. I haven't looked at the book, but also the role of the Holy Spirit in. Next chapter. Yeah, yeah actually, two chapters away. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on that um, because the last week we're going to be doing an application, but the chapter right before is Holy Spirit. And uh, yeah, that's an important aspect, too. All right, so, so let me give you the illustration here in the book where we um, don't like the meaning, and so we change it, and we do the reader response. Um, he gives the illustration of uh, John Lennon, who writes the, the song, I get by with a little help from my friends. And we can probably all sing that song, you know. Um, it, it's well known, and when we try to define friends, you know, what are friends? I mean, friends are friends. Right? I mean, my friends, I mean, I get by, you know, with a little help from my buddies, and I can name them for you, and they're just great guys, and, you know, where would I be without my friends? And yet, John Lennon's idea of friends, I don't think their names, you know, were Roger or John and so forth. Um, they were more like Quaaludes and marijuana. Um, he was definitely making a reference to drugs. Okay? So a lot of people don't know that. Uh, and so you have in your mind what that song's meaning was. And you've done reader response because you didn't even care to really look. In fact, most of those old songs do yourself a favor and don't care to look, all right? Because you'll be gravely disappointed, all right? Um, because most of those songs are not about things that are good. So we can sing, you know, the latest pop song and because we remember the catchy phrase at the end or the chorus. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, re I remember um, Karen not long ago saying, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good song. I think I'll download that song. I said, well, you know, just check the lyrics out. She checked the lyrics out. She said, that's a terrible song. That's a terrible song, you know. Um, so, again, you're going to go back. You're going to look at, all right, here's a, a case of the John Lennon song, and by a little help from my friends. And as reader response goes, you change the meaning. You change the meaning of the song to actually friends being friends, all right? And then you enjoy the song. Uh, you've kind of changed it, and you've changed it uh, for the better, right? And so you say, well, okay, I can change that for the better. You can apply this type of thinking to those things that are uh, books like The Wizard of Oz or certain music 
but the huge question comes, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? You're driving down the road on the way home tonight. You come to the end of the road, and you see one of those red signs that says STOP. Can you apply a reader's response? You can. If a policeman sees you, what's he going to do? He's going to give you a ticket. He's, because he's, he is so all about what's true, you know? And you get an electric bill. That's the other example in your book. You get an electric bill. It's $111. You look at it. You just see the 11. You write him a check for the 11. And you, you, you hope they don't turn off your, your electric, right? I mean, you, you don't have the right, is the point, to apply reader's response to many things in life. You, you don't have the right to do that. So let's stop and let's think about it because the key is uh, when we approach the scripture, how do we handle that? Uh, if you look at this and you say, all right, uh, the Bible. What is the Bible? What do we know the Bible to be? God's word. And we're going to say it's, it's God's word. Um, do you think that changes things? Does, does it give us the option for reader response? Um, does it cause us to pay special attention to authorial intent when the author is none other than the Holy Spirit who's breathed into these men who've written exactly what God wanted them to write? If you read the Bible merely as great literature, I had, uh, in public school, I had English as lit, had a class, or English as lit, that was a terrible class. <laughs> it was Bible as lit, Bible as literature, and that was a pretty terrible class too. But, um, if you look at the Bible from just a, a point of view that um, it's good literature, it'll help you on Jeopardy someday, uh, <laughs> It's got aesthetic value. Um, maybe you can have some moral guidance from it if you're looking for that. And you don't look at it as being revelatory and the true word of God. Then you can interpret the Bible however you want. You can approach the Bible with the standpoint from the standpoint of reader response. You know, it's going to be well. Okay, I, I think this is good, and I'm going to adapt this, and I'm going to throw this out. All right. So your main interpretive question will be, what does this text? mean to me. All right? Why don't you stop and think about that for a moment? <coughs> You're in a Bible study, and you go into the Bible study, and the person who's teaching the Bible study hasn't really had a whole lot of time that week to prep. Does that happen? Sure. And they read a passage of Scripture, and they ask a question. What question do they so often ask? What does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? That's Peter's response, isn't it? I don't care what it means to you. Understand how I'm going to, I'm going to clarify that a little bit so you're not offended. <laughs> I, I don't care that how that, that strikes me. If I'm sitting there, because what is the most important thing we need to know? <laughs> what does it mean, right? Not what it means to me. What does this mean? You have to begin there. And so oftentimes, you go to a, like I say, you go to a Bible study, it's a well-meaning person, they've had a long week, and they just want to get some discussion rolling, and uh, be done in an hour. And so, what's it mean to you? And, and people start offering suggestions, you know, and they're off the wall. They, they really don't measure up. They haven't gone back to look and see what this meant in their town. And they certainly haven't checked it on the biblical map. They're just kind of throwing it out there as to hopefully this thought makes sense. And you're thinking to yourself, what in the world am I doing here? This is really, really not helpful. Let me draw parentheses for you so you understand, so you're not offended. If you read God's word tomorrow morning when you get up, and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart through a passage of scripture, which he often, often, often does, you can look at that and you can say, wow, God's spirit has really spoken to me today. And this is now what this passage means to me. 
All right, does that make sense? And that's a very different equation than looking at it and saying, what does this mean? Hopefully you're doing a little bit of Bible study in there and you've got some background. You, you know where the principalizing bridge is that we've talked about. Gathering those theological principles, you understand that this is what was meant in this day and it still means this and now I can apply it. So you're applying it. When you apply it, that's when it means something to you. If you were teaching a Bible study, you would want to be diligent about beginning uh, the interpretive journey and going through the five steps so that by the time you come to the fifth step, you've already determined this is what the scripture means. Your audience knows now what it means. And then you can open the door and you can say, okay, let's apply this. And you can get relevant, solid application that really is weighty and helpful because you've done the work on it already. But it's, it's death on a Bible study just to throw the door open after you read a passage and say, what's this mean to you? Because you'll get soup to nuts uh, on that. And it just bugs me personally. I have to bite my lip every time I'm sitting in a Bible study and that happens. And it happens all the time. It happens all the time. It's like, will somebody please do the work here? Will somebody please work and delve into the scripture and find out what it meant in their town, what it meant in Jesus' day, what it meant in Paul's day, what it meant for Moses? Would, would somebody do that work and, and would they analyze it from the standpoint of here's some biblical principles that are timeless principles that I, I can look at these principles and then I can, I can check, you know, uh, here's how I can apply them for today. This all has to, to be done in order for us to get to that point um, where we're doing the application. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge, huge part uh, of all of this. Um, let's stop and let's think that through. What does it mean to me? No. I want to know what does it mean. And a good Bible, a good Bible teacher will dig things up and tell you what it means. They'll tell you what it means. And the Spirit of God, as we'll find out in a couple weeks, will take that and he'll work in our heart and change us who we are and move us closer to being like Jesus Christ. So that's really what, what has, to, um, has to happen um, and it's so, so essential. So you've noticed there, um, just before definitions, um, it's essential that we follow the authorial intent approach to interpreting the Bible. In biblical interpretation, the reader does not control the meaning. The author controls the meaning. This, concludes, uh, this conclusion leads us to one of the most basic principles of our interpretive approach. We do not create meaning. We seek to rather discover the meaning that's been placed there by the author. So first thing we need to do is let's define the author. Let's, let's define the author. Um, when we're looking at non-biblical literature, it, it's pretty easy to define the author. When you look at the Bible, we know that the author is God, number one, but we also know he used human instruments along the way. And so we have to identify those human instruments, and that's very, very helpful to us as we strive to know here's what the, um, the meaning is. And so uh, there's a lot of different um, kind of street sign type markers uh, that will go on and, and really help us to be able to do that. Um, that that's hugely, hugely important. All right. Let me just go back, um, if I can backpedal a little bit here. Um, Todd's point uh, with regard to the meaning and understanding the meaning, uh, we have historically, I think that's, that's a brilliant observation, historically, uh, you know, the, the Catholic Church used to have a, a Latin Bible that was basically chained to the front of the church. You couldn't, you couldn't take it. You couldn't uh, read from it on your own. And you were pretty much left up to the priest who would pass down from the Pope. The Pope would pass it down. Here's what these meanings are. In fact, uh, if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, you see many of the, the meanings, um, many of the Liturgies, many of the beliefs are actually tied to 1500s, uh, 1600s. You see that quite a bit. When things change, we talked about Bible translations last time, and the printing press comes on the scene, 
And here we are now. We've, we've all got Bibles, and we've got multiple Bibles. We, we, we have one for every day of the week, and we're excited about that. That's a blessing um, to be able to have that. But in our churches, in the, in the book of Acts, you read about the Bereans who, who search the scriptures all the time so that they would know. And the pastor of the church, the elders of the church who were given to the study of the word of God would expressly teach the word of God. And the checks and balances were what? What were the checks and balances between the speaker? Who was holding the speaker to the truth? The congregation. The congregation. The congregation was knowledgeable <laughs> about the word of God. And they would hold his feet to the fire. They would hold his feet to the fire. They would, they would, and you know what? It wasn't the deacon's job or somebody else who held an office in the church. It was the people. The, the people were supposed to be students of the word. And as time's gone on, I'll be very honest with you, but the church has become much, much more illiterate. And to Todd's point that he makes, it's a, it's a great observation, but pastors stand up now, and it's not to their, uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking down on pastors, I think I am. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is that a lot of people aren't serious students about the word of God. You know, and so um, the pastor could become deviant in his um, study of the scripture and his application, and he can become errant. And who would step in and point to the direction that's you know that's north, and you need to you know correct this or challenge them? And you're seeing that more and more where um, churches are drifting off into different doctrines that are really extra biblical. And the people aren't really sure about um, what is being taught, um, what is exactly being said, what's being taught, because we're not the students of the word that we were even 20 years ago. So that's a that's a, a, a big uh, point of, of concern. So I piggybacked off just a little bit of what you were saying, Todd. Um, it, it is concerning. Um, it, it's concerning. Uh, it, it truly is. Because if we approach, for instance, uh, a pastor's message that they give on Sunday morning, if we approach it with the same reader response mentality, well, what's that mean to me? Um, you might walk away and say, oh, that was really good. <laughs> and it might not be really all that biblical. <laughs> See? And that's what you have to be careful of. There's some great motivational speakers out there. There really are. I mean, there's some fantastic motivational speakers. Um, and some of them are are quote unquote pastors uh, now and people you know get lift but sometimes the truth isn't spoken and unfortunately people aren't picking up on it or they're willing to let the truth slide we'll let it slide we won't worry about it too much it's a little off but oh well you know we kind of like overall what's going on you know what are your thoughts on that let me just throw that out there that's well, like the seeker friendly churches yeah. where they try to have a a sugar-coated message without the, the honesty, the truth in love that should be spoken. I think that's one reason why you have to be good churches, because they want to go to build your build good church. There's no spiritual discernment either. I mean, it's just... And discernment only comes from the study of God's Word, right? We would, we would understand that. Yeah. Well, if we look, look at uh, God's model, right? Up with your point about the, the, the author being God, right? But the instruments being the men who wrote it that were God breathed, right? Is that he uses, just in the Gospels alone, uses four different mediums uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were four distinct passages or methods for getting the message out. The message remains the same, but it takes on a different context uh, based on you know, a Jewish context and a physician, you know, physician's context. Yeah. And so I think, you know, what we run into now is that we don't mm -hmm. have that, like you said, that accountability. You should be able to reconcile all those messages no matter which church you walk into and say that's the same here at Faith Community Church that it is at some mm -hmm. tabernacle or temple somewhere else, and that's not the case. Yeah. And unfortunately, the public sees all churches as being the same, so they walk into one and they uh, 
look at our body here and say, well, that must be the same messed up broken body that I saw down at you know, Main Street. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of challenges, without a doubt, to that. And uh, it, it's um, some good things happening and some things that are concerning, obviously, uh, when you look at that. There's a little bit of review here, and uh, just want to just stop for a second and look at the review. You have uh, five steps. There are five steps to get to that point where we arrive at the understanding of what does this passage mean, and then we move on to how you apply this to your life. Meaning is something we can validate. I think that's that's pretty much a key point here. Um, it's tied to the text and the intent of the author, not to the reader. So the meaning of the text is the same for all Christians. We believe that? That's a critical question, isn't it? Is, it? is it the same for all Christians? We would say that there's reason to go back, for instance, into Jesus' day and look at what is happening in his life and ministry and what he's trying to convey and understand that those important points that he's trying to convey, they might have uh, a bit of a, a Jewish bent to it, all right? But, and we might not apply that directly, obviously, to ourselves, because that theological uh, principle isn't going to carry over necessarily. But for instance, last Sunday, when we were talking about uh, the boat, and the boat's filling with water, and then Jesus is called upon, and he stills the sea, what, what are some theological principles that are timeless principles that we can um, offer to the disciples right then and there as they were in the boat in the night and also offer to ourselves today? What are some theological principles that carry over? Jesus is trustworthy. What's that? Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is trustworthy. Very good. Jesus is near. Jesus is near. Yeah. Jesus will help us. What else? He has control over nature. He has control over nature. He's more powerful than nature. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'm going to say I'm not sure about this one, I'll say. But when life gets tough, mm -hmm. right, Jesus can calm the storm. That is, it's life storms, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of like yeah. application kind of thing. What do you think of that uh, application? Is that a... Is that, a, is that a legitimate one, do you think, or is that the... I, I think that's a common one. So I'm not going to look at it like it's an application as much as I'm going to look at it like it's a theological principle. Because that's what I'm, I'm asking, okay, are, is that a theological principle? That when times are difficult, yeah. we can call upon Jesus. Right. Yeah. And I would say yes, that's true. So, yeah. so that's a good theological principle. Now, the application that we're going to talk about in a couple weeks... When you're teaching a, a Bible study, when you're teaching a Sunday school class, whatever, you're going to always want to bring in that application. The application, remember, is 2018. All right? So you can apply it. You know, here's where we are. This is the mess we're in. This is the situation we find ourselves in today. And this is, this is the Jesus that we can call on, and he can deliver us. Uh, we can go to him. We can pray, and, and we can seek uh, you know, his intervention. So that's the reality. And so you can apply it a lot of different ways. Application is fun because um, by the time you establish that theological principle, your application can go in 50 different directions, and you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Remember the illustration that I gave when we started to write down applications. The only thing you want to do uh, is you want to make sure that the application that you're trying to, to really uh, teach is tied back to a theological principle. Because that would be the question I would ask you. If we, were, if we had an exam, I would say, so where did you get that out of the text? Okay, where did you, you get that application? Um, we, could say, um, we could say, well, you know, we just got through reading about Jesus still in the storm and being in the back of the boat. And the application for us today is that uh, Jesus is omnipresent. Is it true that Jesus is omnipresent? Yes. yes. Did you get that from the passage? No. <laughs> I didn't get that from that passage. So I can say something that's true, but I want to be able to get it from that passage. That's what you want to do as well if you're doing any type of teaching. 
you want to make sure that you're pulling it from that passage. Lots of good things. You could just kind of spray it out there, but you want to make sure that one thing is true, that you pulled it out of that passage. So if someone asks you that question, you can say, here's where I find that. All right, so that's a kind of an important, important point. So step one is grasp the text in the biblical town. In other words, what did it mean to the original audience? I'm having a lot of fun with that this week as I'm preparing for Sunday's message because they finally get the boat over to the other, sea of, other side of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm envisioning them. Remember, the Bible says it's flat calm. All right. I have had the opportunity, many of you have too, where you've been at night rowing a boat. And it's been flat calm. And you know exactly what it sounds like to pull the oars. And this demon inspired individual hears them coming. Have you ever been on the water at night and heard the sound how even voices carry, like unbelievably? This demoniac hears them coming. And he comes tearing on down this hill just as it's starting to get light. And can you imagine being the disciples? I mean, you're freaked out, right? So, so this is so I love this passage because it's so much fun trying to put yourself back into that spot and be able to understand it as they understood it. I'd love to have one of the disciples come in this Sunday and speak on this. <laughs> All right. I'd love for him to come in and say, okay, so I was there. I happen to be in the second boat, not the first one. Thank the Lord. All right. Uh, you know, but he could tell us how it all went down and how exciting that would be. So as you're um, trying to teach and you're, you're teaching a lesson or you're teaching a group, what you want to make sure you do is do the diligence in this. Put yourself back in that time period. Pick up on the little things. It's what colors out and fills out the technicolor um, of that lesson. And so uh, that's, that's huge. That, that's just huge. So I'm having fun with that this Sunday. I love this study, the book of Mark. Um, there, there's all kinds of good things. I'm already fired up about the Sunday after this Sunday. So I think that's just phenomenal. I just can't wait to go there. But it would be just wrong to skip this week. I mean, you want to find out what happens now. Huh? All right. So step number two, measure the width of the river to cross. And when we say the river to cross, we're talking about the differences between the biblical audience and us. In other words, they can understand it. We're a lot farther removed, and we're trying to understand it. So, and then cross the principalizing bridge. Exactly what is the theological principle or principles? And we said when we were doing that section, there's usually only one or two main theological principles. So if you were to limit it to two theological principles for last Sunday's message, dealing with Jesus stilling the sea, what would those two theological principles be? Okay, Jesus rescues us. He's our deliverer. He's our savior. However you want to couch that, it is one general principle. Good. Trust him. What's that? Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. You can trust Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. So those are those are good points. Um, the fourth step is that we would consider the biblical map. In other words, we're going to make sure this isn't heretical. We want to make sure it agrees with the rest of Scripture. And then the last one's the application. All right. So. Those are all very uh, important examples. Go to um, the section here, determining what the author meant. So our presuppositions about authorial intent will affect our approach of study. What's a presupposition? Good time to review that. What's a presupposition? I think a poet's here. Um, share the gospel with people who have no history in the Bible, like when we were in Russia, in Kramadenia. And so, as I preach, I was constantly going to the scriptures. I wasn't given the answers. I constantly referenced back. And I was trying to communicate where my faith and my confidence was. And it was interesting how the people picked up on that. Mm -hmm. We also had a community, yet another gentleman, and he was always giving all the answers. Um, didn't need to reference the Bible, was preaching, and there's little growth from that particular approach. Mm -hmm. So my own personal dependence on the scriptures communicates to our audience. Yeah. 
Exactly. And our presupposition, uh, if we if we take the presupposition, and uh, hopefully this is your presupposition, that the Bible is God's word, divinely inspired, um, all scripture given by inspiration of God, and is uh, sufficient to bring about the, the person of God, to, to make them into uh, the follower Christ wants them to be, then the word of God is very, very important, supreme in our, in our life. That's our presupposition. And we would say then that um, we're going to define as that which the author wishes to convey with his signs. The signs we refer to are the conventions of language, syntax, grammar, word meaning, context, so forth. Uh, all of those things are very important. Remember, the meaning is tied to context. It's not determined solely by grammar or dictionary definitions. In other words, you can't simply look up a word, do a word study like we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, and have that be sufficient. We have to bring that word back into the context in order to be able to understand what the meaning is. So meaning is tied uh, directly to the one who produced the signs and to the context uh, in which he produce them. Uh, the illustration in your notes is, uh, suppose you asked a five-year-old what's under the hood of his parents' car. Uh, some five-year-olds could tell us that the engine is under the hood. Um, however, what does the child envision when he says engine? He's probably thinking of something that's big, that's noisy, um, it makes the car go. And if it doesn't start, Mom or dad is pretty upset at the engine, right? So um, if you, however, went to a car mechanic and you asked them uh, about what's under the hood, they might come up and tell you, well, it's a 350 cubic inch V8 and it has four barrel and it has, uh, you know, monthly transmission and yada, yada, yada. Um, and, you know, it's got, you know, turbocharged and supercharged and et cetera, et cetera. Well, we would, tend to understand that um, it's not mysterious at all to the mechanic, uh, but to the child, it's something that he really doesn't understand. And we would be misunderstanding the two people if we use the mechanic's definition of the engine to interpret the child's statement, or if we use the child's definition of the engine to understand the mechanics. So we have to stop and think about the bigger picture of this and put these words into the context. Um, great illustration here. An African evangelist from Liberia um, was visiting the United States. He's speaking on a bunch of churches. One Sunday night in Tennessee, he's driving to his next speaking engagement. He reflects on how big and beautiful uh, the full harvest moon was. So later he's at that church in the evening and he's speaking to the church and he makes a statement how much he liked the moonshine uh, they had in that part of the country. He assumed that in English, if you had sunshine during the day, you had moonshine at night. An easy mistake to make. No doubt he drew quite a few chuckles, right? So the story shows us an illustration of authorial intent and meaning. Lexically, moonshine refers to an illegal, homemade, strong, alcoholic <coughs> beverage, or hooch, or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, so authorial intent was the more important aspect there. And you could understand it because there's a context. If there was no context, it would be much more difficult to ascertain the reality there. And so if you were just listening to him speak, uh, you, you know what he meant, right? You, you know what he meant. Um, hopefully some of you are going to be like, I don't know, I don't know about that guy. You know? I think he's probably, but you get the idea. Uh, the context helps us greatly understand the author's intent. Authors cannot always express exactly what they want to say in literature. And that's an important notation. Literature has limitations. And if literature has limitations, when we translate it from Greek or Hebrew into English or any other language, you're going to complicate that, aren't you? So it's going to become even a little bit trickier. So our key is to run to the context and look carefully at that context. We're going to use the Greek, the, the grammar rather, the syntax, word meaning to convey um, a, a general meaning, but we're going to understand how it all fits together 
by considering that, uh, that context. Uh, and I think that that is a, a huge, huge, important uh, point. So again, our approach is to focus on the author's intention rather than the reader's response. Um, and the context is going to help guide us. We're going to look at the historical background. We're going to, at times, do word studies. We're going to look carefully at translations, genres. All those things are important as we try to mine out of scripture the actual intention of the author. Uh, and uh, I think it was Todd, you said that uh, you made a notation that in the Gospels you have four different viewpoints um, all right there because there's four different authors. And uh, it's fascinating. I mentioned this on Sunday. I don't know if you picked up on it. But Mark was much more direct in quoting uh, you know, the disciples, kind of their argumental type of attitude towards Jesus. You know, teacher, you know, don't you care that we perish? I mean, don't you care? Um, and the other authors kind of smooth that over. They're not quite as edgy, uh, you know, not quite. So you go back through and you really have to, to do all of that diligent work in order to be able to arrive uh, at that meaning. And there are times when you're going to, um, you're, you're going to do a lot of work, you're going to try to understand, and uh, there are passages that are very difficult to understand. And you're going to walk away and you're going to say, well, I think this passage has, you know, two possible directions it could go. It either means this or it either means that. <laughs> and I've had, I've had a number of times where I've had to say that. This, this either means this or this means that. And um, my personal persuasion is that it means this. Because you, there are some things you really can't sit on the fence on. I just, and if I asked you about some of your presuppositions, you would have presuppositions you're not sitting on the fence with. You've, you've made a decision, and maybe you don't even realize it. If you had to walk it back, you might look at it and say, well, there was another direction I could have gone and still been fair to the scriptures with, right? And so you, you want to be as honest as you possibly can. But at the same time, sometimes you just have to make a decision. You either got to go with A or B, and your diligence is, is done, and you make that decision, you go that direction. And uh, it's, it's a good, fair study. But again, humility goes with all of this, right? We've talked about that. Humility goes with all of it. Uh, no one can be dogmatic and say that they, they know everything, even though we go through all of these steps and do the work to try to determine um, the meaning. What's the most important takeaway from tonight? Just simply this. God controls the meaning because God gave the message. He controls the meaning. And what we want to find, Lord, is what you meant. And what you meant to them, so that we can figure out what this means to me today. And that's kind of uh, the bottom line. Now next, next week we have VBS. The week after, when we come together, we'll talk about levels of meaning. We get into a very, very critical phase of this study. And I, I know it's only one week, uh, but it's critical. Because we would say, how do we... If we went all the way back to the very beginning and we said, what is our hermeneutic? Has anybody looked at the church bylaws since we wrote those new ones? Anybody looked at them? All right, once maybe. Um, that's good. <laughs> right in the beginning, I put in there, here's our method of interpretation. I don't know if you picked up on that. Kind of sets us apart. Okay, here's, here's our hermeneutic. This is how we interpret scripture, the community church. Well, we're going to look at the, the, we're going to take it as literal. We're going to look at the history. We're going to look at the grammar. We're going to do all of those things. So that is going to establish the basic levels of meaning to God's work, right? And it's important. Now, if you establish that basic hermeneutic, you stay within the lines pretty well. You stay within the lines. You, you're, you're not going to go way off on a tangent, come up with something bizarre. Right? You're not going to be gathering at the hilltop because Jesus is coming back because you figured out the numbers and okay, um, you sold everything and that's where you're going to hang out. You're not going to do that. You're going to stay within the hermeneutic, the method of interpretation that is so critical. There are different forms that people have utilized over the ages uh, for hermeneutics. 
We're going to talk about that uh, next time in two weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about allegorical interpretation. We're going to talk about spiritualizing things. We're going to have a little exercise in that. It'll be fun. Um, and we'll laugh, okay? But hopefully it'll make the point. Uh, we, um, we see the allegorical. I'll point out where you see allegorical interpretation among certain denominations um, so that you can pick up on that. Um, and say, well, okay, you know, huh, this group is going to be allegorical, uh, you know, when it comes to eschatology, for instance. So uh, we'll we'll treat those different um, th those different subjects uh, next time when we get together. So that's an important uh, time. And then the week after that, uh, we briefly touch on the role of the Holy Spirit in interpretation and then application as well. So some good things, some good things for sure. Yeah, any comments, questions? before we wrap it up here tonight. Yeah, I, I, for the first time, it set in my mind the difference. You, you go into a church or you talk to people and they say, this is what God's word said. And for the first time, it got me. It's what God meant. Mm -hmm. I never, you know, never met that. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Any other thoughts? All right. We're obviously praying for folks here at Faith Community Church. We have uh, some, some tough situations. Um, ask you to pray for the Moss family. Uh, and uh, also praying for our sister in the Lord, Tracy uh, Baldwin, as well. And, uh, Definitely needing the, the touch of the Lord here. So why don't we uh, have a word of prayer? Our Father, we thank you that you have given to us uh, the your intended meaning. And we're just thrilled, Lord, that here we are, so many years after the words were given to the authors, Lord, that we can have in our possession uh, reliable copies of the original, that we can give our lives to studying and knowing. Um, the author, uh, you, you, Lord, your intention. We pray, Father, that that would help us uh, to spur us on uh, to know, Lord, uh, the true meaning of the text. Help us, Father, with that, I pray. And Lord, uh, as we go from here today, help us to remember uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that are really just uh, going through rough times. And uh, lift up the Moss family, Lord, tonight, and uh, just pray for uh, each one there, Lord, and uh, pray your comfort and strength uh, to be upon them tonight. Uh, Lord, I also lift up uh, Tracy, and Lord, know she's been going through a real rough time, and uh, just uh, ask for you to uh, just be so close to uh, Tracy and Ray, the kids, Lord, and uh, just be with them, and uh, we pray for strengthening, Lord, we pray for miracles. And uh, we know, Lord, that you are the deliverer. You can still the waves. And so, Lord, we continue to pray. And uh, we pray that uh, you would do what only you could do. And uh, we thank you for that. So be with us, Lord, this week, we pray. And guide us as we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>